and he paints these things all times of day as well as at night. Personally, um, Dean, your, your nocturnal paintings are some of my favorites. Um, Dean has exhibited widely in the Southeast. He's a Florida fellowship recipient and his work is in hundreds of public and private collections, um, including Florida Museum of Natural History and Science, IBM, Barnett Bank, Florida State University, the city of Tallahassee, and of course the Gadsden Art Center and Museum. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Dean and, and watching his career for the last 15 years or so since I came to the area and became involved in the art community. And I recall um, talking with him back in the, in, in the recession of 2008 or 2009, and he talked about how an economic downturn was an opportunity for him to um, take a break from some of the painting that he's known for that is in such high demand and experiment with different subject matter. And at the time, he had painted a series of the aging trucks that you see between here and the coast. And we exhibited those at the museum 11 or 12 years ago. Um, he also paints portraits beautifully. And I remember it, 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 during another period, Dean, you were having fun painting portraits. And now we have um, this exhibition, Haunted, which may be seen as a continuation of your landscape painting as opposed to so much of a, a departure from it. Um, of this exhibition, uh, Dean says the landscape has always had a haunting quality for him. Although viewers tend to be captivated by the sense of light, he's always been angling for the spiritual content beneath the surface. And now with this recent work, Dean is more directly confronting the possibility of a parallel world existing with this one. So with that, Dean, welcome. And um, we look forward to hearing you talk about your work and all of you um, are muted for now, but if you have questions um, early in the presentation, you can type them into the chat. So there's a chat button at the bottom of your screen and you can type them into the chat on the lower right and I'll let Angie know we have questions to share with Dean. And then later in the presentation, we will unmute you all so that you can um, ask questions that way. So Dean, welcome. Thank you. We're excited to have you um, here with us to talk about your ex exhibition that we've got coming. Um, I am <clears throat> gonna be kind of asking some questions and, and really uh, getting an idea of, of talking more about this exhibition haunted that we have on display. And I wanna share some of the images of the exhibition. If you haven't gone and seen it already at the museum, it will be up for quite a while, um, but we hope that you'll be able to see it. But what I'm gonna do first is just give you a little sneak peek of the exhibition. And we are recording this. So please, um, if anybody you know wanted to, to join us on this and we're not able to, uh, please um, let them know that we will have that recording up next week. So we're, we're excited to be able to share this. So. Haunted, um, you know, when when looking at your work, Dean, you can kind of feel this haunting effect. Um, but we noticed some of your most obvious representations of spirits are set inside homes. You can see this is kind of a, a good example. Um, is there a reason for this? The, did you feel kind of a direct spiritual presence more associated more associated with indoor settings? Yes. Um... And that comes from childhood. Um, from the time till I was about five or six, I had a sort of spiritual paranormal experience of the world as a child. And I was able to see, you know, this is the way I remember it. And, and memory is, you know, not to be trusted all the time, but we lived in an old Italian house in Pennsylvania, and we actually had funerals in the parlor. When my uncle passed and my granddad passed, they lived in the house. They were laid out in the parlor, you know, with flowers all around. And that's where people came to pay their respects. And my experience was that they didn't leave, that they were always still there. And they would speak to me and, you know, talk to me about things like be a good boy, listen to your mom and dad. But everything took place indoors. And, and all of my experience of the potential of another spirit world, real or imagined, always took place inside. And so I think that's why 
I've never had that experience outdoors of uh, of a visiting spirit of something talking to me. So I think it's just natural that that's how I would present it was how I experienced it. Hmm. Well, there is one piece that you can see um, on the top right, which is, uh, I believe, Moonlight, Moonlight Cypress. Now that one's outside. So how, how is that one a little bit different? Well, that's <laughs> almost an accident. I had, I did two paintings of this Cypress tree, which I think I photographed around 2000 on a canoe trip on the Sop Choppy River. I happened upon the photographs last year and I did them as full bright daylight paintings. Then I started with the ghost stuff indoors and I looked at this one painting and I went, now wait a minute, there's a ghost living in the cypress tree. I, you know, you could almost see it. So I darked it way down so it looked like moonlight. And then I did just enough to the inner part of the tree to create a, a figure, a form that might be a ghost. So that's how that came about. It was spurred on by what I had done previously with the indoor work. Hmm. Interesting. Um, I'm gonna kind of go through a few more of these pieces. Um, hmm. Your paintings appear to have a, really a textured kind of surface. How do you accomplish this? Well, um, that's an interesting question because when I first started out, I. I got criticism for not having much texture in my work. Um, and, you know, I think that was like, uh, because I never felt like I was a natural painter. It's something I had to acquire. I think I had a natural sense of composition and light and, and what to paint, but the the process took, took me a long time. So now I prepare the canvas with some underlying texture to begin with. And I do that by using glaze and, and heavy paint. And I lay down a texture with a fan brush or even a small paintbrush, you know, like a, a, a brush you would paint the house with. And I rapidly apply it to the surface while I'm blowing it with a hairdryer so that it dries real quick. And it already has a built-in texture to it. Then when I work, it's like um, now I, I'm constantly dipping into a glaze and then mixing it with pigment and applying it very rapidly with different kinds of brushes that also create some texture. And then that dries. And then I come back over it with a palette knife and I use a palette knife to paint things. Well, like in this picture, I use the palette knife to paint the edges of the windows, which previously I would have thought, well, that's too sloppy, that's too crude. I don't want it to look that way. And now I'm like, okay, with it looking that way. So I use the tip of a palette knife to create lines and stuff. They're not straight, but it doesn't seem to matter. It seems to actually help the painting in a way. So it's a combination of things, you know, between a knife and, and odd looking brushes, like worn out band brushes are incredible tools for doing things that no other brush can do. And, and I have a whole collection of them. I mean, they go back years and eventually the handles break off and then I gotta move on to something else. But, and I use, paper towels, you know, I, I roll them up, get a fine point on them, dip them in the, the paint, and then just start tapping them. And they can create incredible textures and, and the illusion of great detail incredibly fast. So, you, you know, you can go really fast on this stuff and it looks like it took forever to do, so. Hmm. I'm gonna stop sharing that for a minute. I know we have, um... One question, our intern has, um, Mackenzie has been kind of studying your work a little bit and she has a question for you. Um, Mackenzie, if you wanna unmute yourself and we'll see if we can pop you up on there and you can, um, are you there Mackenzie? Oh yeah, hi. Oh, there <laughs> okay, um, I was wondering um, what in particular about landscapes feels haunting to you and if there was a specific moment when you felt like a spiritual presence outside maybe that changed your perspective on painting? Yeah, that's an interesting question because the, to me the answer would be I brought the spiritual feeling of nature to painting. So when I first started painting, it was in eighth grade, 
I already had that in me. And it's like now suddenly I had found a way to express it with pain. So it was from the very beginning. And it started when I was four or five in Pennsylvania. I felt I had a relationship with objects, trees. There was a, a willow tree in our front yard up on a little hill and it overlooked the town of Scottsdale where I was born. And I used to sit in the crook of that tree at sunset, you know, or in the afternoon. And it was like, I just felt like I was part of the tree. The tree could talk to me, I could talk to the tree. And it's just the way it, the world was to me. And it's just something I had no outlet for until I discovered painting in junior high. So one happened before the other. And then I just was able to explore as life went on, I learned more and more about who I was and what I saw and what I was trying to say. It's just a, it was just a long, decades-long process of, uh, and and the fun part is, you know, at seventy-one, I'm still learning stuff. You know, I've, I've got a new show which has images in it that I've never worked with before, and that's opened up. I just in the past few days, I've, I've had a vision of how I might take this forward, how this might continue to become part of my work in a way a little different from what you're seeing now, but I'm excited about maybe taking it up to some large paintings and uh, trying a new direction. I don't know if it'll work, but I got plenty of time to find out, so. Did that answer anything or was I just talking? <laughs> I think it did. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Um, so, you know, the way that you play with light in your landscapes is really unique and, and very captivating to a lot of people. So when you paint landscapes, do you emphasize the amount of light in space or do you try to create the landscape the way you see it in the flesh? Yeah, I think, um, I have never thought about painting light. That was never an intention or something that I was, oh, this is what I'm going to be. It's just that I, I had a vision. I had a vision of what was interesting to me in the world, how I wanted to frame it, how I wanted to present it. So it was always there right in front of me. I just had a gift for framing it with a camera, knowing what to take a picture of. And I was always interested in dramatic light. It's just, that's what seemed interesting to paint. So it's sort of, again, was always there. The, the vision was always there. I had to catch up with technique. I never felt like I was naturally gifted as a painter. I, I struggled with having the right strokes and the right marks. And I think I was very timid with paint for a long time. That's loosening up some. So I think I, it's technique trying to catch up with vision. The vision was always there. Uh, and I, I just was just gravitated toward the light, the dramatic light in the landscape. So it was kind of a thoughtless process. Just you follow instinct and you get what you get. <laughs> you get what you get. Um, there's a piece in the show that really kind of stands out from a lot of the other ones. It's this one called um, Between Here and There. Mm -hmm. So tell me what inspired the creation of this piece? Well, um, happy accidents, <laughs> you know, can be, can be some of your best stuff. Yeah. It's like, I just have this, the more you think about things, the worse you'll do as an artist. <laughs> That's just my approach to it. Okay. Be intuitive, be instinctual, don't be thoughtful. You know, when you try to plan too much, then the work becomes stilted and I, I don't know, it just doesn't work for me. So there's this portrait sitting in the studio that had been there for 10 years and I had no use for it. I, I really can't even remember the guy's name, the portrait I painted. I know he moved away a long time ago. And I just took it out one day and, and started playing with putting a skull over the portrait. And again, it's a sense of play. It's a sense of experiment. Well, what is this going to be? And then the technique that's helped me 
to these ghostly figures is this flat brush filled with uh, glaze and thin white paint, which I've learned to just drag over the canvas and create these ribbons, which layer upon layer and you dry them and then you do another one over that and another one over that. And you get these this incredible depth of these ribbons just playing with each other, sort of fanning out from the skull. And, I, and there's also still flesh from the portrait left with the skull. So it's like a combination. And then the crowning touch for me was to leave the eyes so that the skull has human eyes. And it was just something to do, something to, well, what, what will happen if you do this? Then later you can come back and make a story about it and you'll sound really smart, like you had a brilliant idea. <laughs> And you do, but it's the subconscious, you know, there's something other going on that you need to get out of the way of that and let it come up and do what it wants to do without impinging your thoughts on it. Don't try to guide it, let it guide you, let it take you somewhere. And then again, you get what you get. And then you can make up a cool story about it, but it's sort of just playing, you know, you're just playing with emotion and idea and technique possibilities of what your hands can do you know it's, it's oh, oh, and the title is between here and there it's to me that's like bridging between being alive and not being alive it's between here still alive and there which then you're somewhere else yeah. so that's what the title was about it's um it's interesting because when I look at some of these pieces, you know, especially the kind of more ghostly ones like we've been talking about, they don't, they leave a lot more up to interpretation than say some of your other, you know, more straightforward landscape pieces. And so I think that's really interesting for uh, our visitors and then people who may be familiar with your work or have known it for many years, you know, um, and, you know, I've been lucky like Grace to have been you know, working with you for many years and it's it's been interesting to see kind of um, the progression of your work and and how these are much more um, you know up to interpretation the the viewer can kind of bring to it what they see you know especially for a piece like between here and there there's a lot of different um, things you can kind of um, get from that so I think that's really um, well I think that you know art for me should be asking a question not answering it hmm. you just you're you're just throwing it out there. Well, what do you think about this? I mean, that's basically what the paintings say is like, what do you think about this? Maybe this is possible. Maybe that happened. Maybe it didn't. I mean, if you read about memory in human beings, your memory changes drastically every 10 years from people who've researched this, that if they ask a question about the event in your life when you're 20, the answer will be different when you're 30, which kind of, it leaves us with, we're all sort of living in a made up story, you know, that changes every decade. It becomes, and so what do you think about that? You know, that's what I'm asking with these paintings is like just throwing it out there, you know, and, and hopefully it's interesting to look at. That's really important to me that they be really interesting to look at, that they have a certain amount of light and composition and texture and technique I think it's important that if I'm an artist and I, and I want people to take my work seriously, I feel like I have to offer them some studied, long developed technique, which shows my commitment to what I'm doing, that I cared enough about it to learn to do it really well. And so it's important to me that the surfaces look good and that they make sense and that they're interesting to look at. Mm. I think we had a, a, a question in the chat that I wanted to ask real quick. Um, Cynthia um, asked, she said, I recently took a webinar on the frames influence on a piece of art offered by the National Museum of London. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> um, she said, I wonder if you consider this when you select a frame for a particular piece or is it not as important? Um, it depends on the piece, like some of them, um, 
I have a real desire to, to put them in a certain kind of frame, like the Marsh Moon piece that's in the exhibit. I think I put that real dramatic Baroque black and gold frame on that because it just sort of, it just gave the painting a life and a, a presence. But because I'm in the business of selling my art, um, I'm always having to deal with people's taste, you know, like, so I can't go too far down that rabbit hole because I have to depend on somebody wanting to buy it and then having to negotiate the frame. Yeah, that's the one. I thought that frame just made that, it just made that painting look very powerful and the way I wanted it to appear. So yeah, the framing is, I want the frames to be really nice and I want them to be fairly big because that gives gravitas to the work. And I try to stick with pretty plain, you know, wide, flat, gold and silver, because you can sort of cover everything with wide, flat, gold and silver. You can make it work on anything. And then occasionally I go to these dark black frames with gold liners or even something really ornate like this. Um, but I don't do that too much. It's just kind of what works. What an interesting question. It's really good. Hmm. Um, this piece here, Last Light, you know, has almost a different kind of tone to it. It's really uh, feels even more haunting. Is this painting based on a real place? And if so, uh, what's the story behind it? Where did you come across it? Yeah, this has been interesting. Um, there's two paintings in the exhibit that, that were done from black and white photographs. When I started out, I photographed everything in black and white, developed my own film and printed it myself in a little tiny dark room. So everything I worked from was black and white. So that puts this in a certain period, which would probably be the late 70s. When I lived out off of Highway 59 in uh, Jefferson County, I was I photographed this, I think, around Cheris Crossroads off of a dirt road, which is the same one where I photographed the house in remaining. And these are really old photographs that I stumbled upon recently. That's like one of my favorite things to do is go back through photographs that are 30, 40 years old and look at them with new eyes and see if, is there something here I missed that I might want to do? So I found this, this was a black and white photograph taken on a winter afternoon, broad daylight. So when I started working on it and I think I, tried to present it that way as a, and then I went no this is there's not enough going on here so I eventually started turning it into twilight and then I inserted the street light which wasn't there and and then I took one of the old cars <laughs> from my paintings 10 or 12 years ago and I put that in the picture sitting in the yard by the house by the gas station and then I put light in the gas pumps as if they were still functioning and they really aren't. And, you know, last light has about three meanings. You know, it's the sky, it's the light, it's the place itself. And it just, you know, just gradually turned it into this sort of haunted image of a place no longer in use, no longer inhabited. But it's like the place itself is trying to stay alive with the light, with the street light and the gas pumps. It's, it's not giving up even though the humans are gone. I think the um, the light, you know, like you said, that's really interesting. I didn't really notice that where the, it, there, it looks like there's the light on the gas pumps. I feel like that almost gives it that kind of ghostly, un, you know, unearthly feel because you're not expecting there to be any, um, you're not expecting there to be any light there. You're not expecting it looks abandoned. It looks- um, Yeah, you know. it's like the gas pumps become ghosts. Yeah. I mean, they're kind of ghostly figures, you know? How long do we have to stand here? <laughs> <laughs> they're asking each other. <laughs> Interesting. Um, uh, so this is kind of a more a more basic thing. You, you kind of gone over that, but- um, you talked a little bit about how you got into painting, you know, when you were younger, um, but when did you kind of realize your fascinations with this landscape and kind of, I know you said you weren't really, didn't intend necessarily to be um, known as the painter of light, but what was it, do you think that, um, 
when when do you think that you kind of realized that? Well, I think um, I had never painted until the eighth grade. I drew a little bit here and there. But I got into an art class in the eighth grade at Southwest Junior High in Lakeland, Florida, and we had a really great art program and a really great teacher. And right away, I had a gift. I mean, I stood out right away. You know, we were working in watercolors. And the magic to me was, you know, I'd always had such strong feelings about nature, you know, before I ever painted. And now all of a sudden I had this vehicle, you know, this way of expressing what had always been there. And it was so freeing, it was so magical. I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine how exciting it was then. It's hard to remember just how exciting it was to be able to do something that gave so much voice to a part of me that I had never been able to voice before. So, uh, you know, I just, I never gave it up. I just kept going with it. And, you know, I jumped off that cliff out of college where I started, wherever I lived, I put a little studio together and I would work and I, I never had employment. You know, I was employed for like one year after college. And since then it's been on my own making paintings and selling them for money and trying to keep going. That was the whole process. It's pretty impressive. There's very few people who've been able to, to do that. So you know, you're one of the few artists I know. Well, it's, it's your willingness to have almost nothing <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> right. Not many people are willing to do that, but um, that's the way it went. So. Sure. Um, I wanted to talk about this piece real quick. Um, you had shown me some of the source photographs from this image. Um, where was that again? Will you tell, tell everybody? Um, the Balsam Mountain Inn uh, on the Florida Georgia line, just off the Blue Ridge Parkway. It's actually, I mean, uh, Georgia, North Carolina line, Georgia, North Carolina. You're just into North Carolina. Um, and Amy was doing seminars up there at Western. Western Carolina University. And I tag along and we stayed in this incredible three-story inn called the Balsam Mountain Inn. Very old. And, you know, it was late winter when we were there. Some snow on the ground one, one year we were there. And it wasn't very many people there. So I would wander around the inn during the day and all the rooms would be open. And I just would wander around with my camera and go in and and photograph the winter light coming through these, these different rooms. And I, I've done a lot of paintings of the interior of that place. Only this year did I put some ghosts in there. Hmm. But it seemed like, yeah, I, I rediscovered all this material that had been sitting dormant for going on 20 years. And I went, wait a minute, you know, let's, and I don't, you know, I didn't even, I started doing the interior and, and I went, what if, and then you, you paint a ghost on a chair and you go, wow, that, that looks really interesting. Let's paint another ghost in the other chair. And that's kind of how it went. Again, you know, kind of accidental that get out of your own way and let something happen. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so this is a kind of a fun thing. What is your favorite part about painting? I, it's the freedom of, you know, just, it's another place. I mean, I go to a completely another place where my brain unhooks from the rational, from the real. And I listen to music all the time when I'm painting and that helps me go to another place where I'm engaging a whole different unit of things where it's time, it's sensibility, it's physical technique, the use of your hands, the use of your eyes, and the use of a certain knowledge, which is very hard to put in words, where you're controlling a surface and making it do what a part of your brain is telling it, it needs to do what it needs to look like and your hands are listening to that, but it is not rational and it is not something you can really talk about very effectively, but it's like you're just taken away from the everyday, you know, 
and you're in this other world. And it's really odd because you know, I've been wearing a Fitbit for about 10 years. And when I'm painting, when I'm really in the flow of painting, which goes on for you know, a couple hours each day where you're just really wrapped up, my heart rate is higher than when I'm riding my mountain bike. When I'm painting, my heart rate's about 125. And it's like a workout. I mean, it's a real physical thing. And my voice gets very hoarse. I don't know why that is, but when I finish a session, it's I can't talk very well for a while. It takes me a while for my voice to. So there is something going on there that is not easy to explain, but you know, I crave it. I mean, I, I have to have that to feel like I, I still belong here, that, I, that I'm doing my job. Wow, that is so fascinating, the physical aspect of it. I never would have thought of that. Um, I wonder if there's other painters um, that you know of who experienced that same thing. I'd be curious to know. Um, yeah, I don't know. I stand when I paint. I, I used to sit down when I did these really detailed paintings, which I have almost no patience for anymore. I just, like I used to do these detailed paintings at the North Florida Fair, where I would paint in every little thing, you know, every little lollipop and popcorn box and everything. And, you know, it's like, I can't even believe I did that. But now it's like, I stand and I move constantly. And sometimes I'm moving to the music and sometimes I'm almost dancing to the music while, you know, my left hand is handing my right hand stuff and my left hand's holding the photograph I'm looking at. and and I'm really wrapped up in the music and I'm just connected and there's all, you know, a lot of physical movement, but there's something about the process that really elevates my heart rate. Hmm. I can't really explain why. That's interesting. Um, well, you know, I know we're, uh, it's kind of that, that time of um, strange time, but is there anywhere else you're exhibiting your work or um, that anyone else can find besides at the museum? Our, you know, our, your exhibition right now is up um, through March, but um, well, where I'm basically representing myself. Um, in the last few years, I've pulled most of my work from galleries because they weren't doing that well. And the all the travel and loading and unloading, I was just like, I, okay, I'm 70, I've had enough, you know. So I'm basically, you know, working off Facebook and my website and, um, you know, whatever happens. And there's enough residual out there that I still have collectors that go way back and they still get in touch with me. And so there's still business happening. And, you know, I have a show at Sage Restaurant. I'm showing there for two months starting next week. There'll be like 13 or 14 paintings will be there in, in public sort of. But right now, no, not much. I mean, just me and my website and my house is a showroom that hasn't worked too well because of the pandemic you know you can't people don't want to go out and I frankly don't want them to come into my house right now so it's just you know it's a weird time but I'm surviving I'm doing okay yeah well we're excited that you were able to exhibit with us um, and we were able to have this exhibition and um, also you will be at the museum at here in Gadsden on Saturday, uh, February 27th between 12 and two. And if anybody wants to come and see the exhibition in person, Dean will be here um, and able to um, safely distance and talk to you about the works in person if you've got some more questions. But in the meantime, do we have any questions from the audience? Um, I don't know if Grace had any other ones or if anybody wants to either put it in the chat or they can um, kind of unmute themselves and, and ask. Angie, I just wanted to point out um, in Dean's exhibition and any of the exhibitions in our curated galleries, um, as an accredited museum, we're not directly selling this work, but if you have seen anything today that you're interested in or you come to the museum and you fall in love with the piece, we will put you directly in touch with Dean um, for that transaction. Um, so I had somebody come in to pick up their auction items from our fundraiser last week, and then they walked into your gallery, Dean, and said they fell in love with the piece. So, so that is our process. For well, you. maybe I'll hear from them then. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Are people just afraid to ask me a question or they're just not interested? What is it? 
I think we're just being polite. Um, don't want to talk over one another. But Dina, I have a couple questions for you. I do too. Um, <laughs> you want to go first? Well, I would love to. Uh, hi, Dean. I am hi, curious hi. if you feel like that you're being channeled when you paint. Yeah, that's a tricky word. Um, but yeah, sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, I've always felt like the conduit, you know, that's a sort of overused term. But yeah, I mean, you, you sort of got to look at it that way because, you know, you it's bigger than you and you know, you're not the thing, you're the messenger is kind of the way I look at it. And, you know, just just shut up and get out of the way and, and mm -hmm. let the message come through. So yes, the answer would be yes. Thank you. So Dean, um, my question, one of two questions to you is, um, of course, through the pandemic, how, um, how, what impact has that played on your decision uh, to be painting such ethereal and ghostly figures? The, you know, I I'm not sure because I, th I guess it did in the sense that it really brought up the idea of death because so many people were getting really sick and, and a lot of them were dying and I'm in that age group where you don't want to be messing with this virus because, you know, you're old and vulnerable. And so I think it just pressed into action. So a theme I've thought about my whole life is about death. It's always been something that I've wondered about. And as a young man, I felt like I knew what would happen after you died. And the older I got, the less certain I became. Uh, and so I think, I guess I was just playing with that, that idea again, you know, and I think the pandemic triggered it, a sense of dread, which I think I was trying to ease by painting these figures. And somehow that made it more palatable to me that, you know, maybe there is something after this. Everybody's got their ideas. Mine are kind of up in the air. I'm not sure about any of it. Nancy, did you have a question? Oh, sorry. You um, had two questions, Ruth? I did, part two of my question. This is an extraordinary collection of paintings, Dean. It's just a beautiful exhibit. Thank um, you. I I've been really drawn to some of your other paintings where you have used fire. So I wonder if you would just talk about the, the fire in some of your pieces. And if no one, if y'all have not seen those images of Dean's, I really encourage you to. Well, I think it, it's actually, to me, a very similar thing. It's like the um, fire is like a spiritual thing to me, too. You know, it's like it has to do with, you know, both cleansing and terror. You know, that the images I've painted with fire, most of them have more to do with the idea of terror or mob violence or people going off the rails, which um, we've all had a taste of that recently. Um, so yeah, it's, it's ex exploration of darkness is what I would say. It's when I go to that image, it's because I'm trying to talk about the darkness in people in the world and where that can go. Thanks, Dean. I think um, Nancy had a question next. Dean, I was just curious as to what kind of music you listen to when you're working. Yeah, that can be all over the place. Um, but I, recently, I, I've just, you know, I've always been fond of symphonic type music. I grew up listening to classical music, but also, you know, rock and roll and jazz. And, you know, Pat Metheny is an all time favorite of mine. And I consider his, his work to be the soundtrack of my life because I've listened to him through the decades and but I'm also a big fan of film music. Um, Thomas Newman and Newton How James Newton Howard are two uh, uh, film composers that I've listened to a lot since the pandemic started. I listen to their music on Pandora. You just go to the Thomas Newman channel 
for the James Howard Newton channel. And you'll hear all this incredible film music from different composers. And I got stuck on the soundtrack by James Newton Howard to The Hunger Games, a movie I've never seen, but, you know. <laughs> but the music was just unbelievable and I, I got addicted to it. I finally got off that recently. And so for the past week, I've been listening to Pat Metheny, Pandora channel. And that's been great because it's brought back a lot of memories of music that I'd forgotten about, both from him and other artists. So yeah, I like that. Okay. Um, Nancy, would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I just had a comment and would like to hear what Dean has to say. Um, the painting of the skull between here and there or whatever the title was, I forget yeah. exactly. Um, is so reminiscent to me of Victorian, not just painting, but Victorian sensibility. Mm. Uh, they were pretty obsessed with death. Uh, there, there are lots, you know, all of those old um, pieces of hair from dead people that they put into brooches and, and death masks and all that sort of thing. And um, it's different from your other things. I mean, a, a lot different. Mm -hmm. um, I just am interested in your thought process of even deciding to do that because well, it's not like your other work to me. Yeah, and as I explained earlier, um, it is not a, what I would call a thought process. It's a, it's a playful experiment. It's like you just are looking for something to do that day and I had developed a series of techniques that I finally found a way to express them differently by working over the top of a portrait that was already there and a decade old. And it just sort of played itself out. Um, it wasn't a thoughtful endeavor. It was just a freedom or you know, a chance to do something and just see how it went. Because you know, there's no consequence. If it doesn't work out, well, it doesn't work out. Nobody ever sees it, and that's the end of it. But I thought it worked out. It's the more I looked at it after I finished it, particularly, like I'll photograph something at the end of the day, and then I'll sit on the couch at night with my phone and look at it on my phone and see things in it that I never even realized I did. And then you blow it up on your phone, and you keep going over it and, and, I, and by the end of the evening, I went, that's a pretty special painting. You ought to hang on to that. <laughs> Don't paint over it tomorrow because <laughs> sometimes I'll do that. So, so that's how well, I- Thank you. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to seeing it in person when we come yeah. to, the, to the exhibit. Good. I hope you enjoy it. Richard, would you like to go ahead and, and uh, make your uh, question? I don't know if you can hear me or not, but uh, yeah, yep. can hear you. Um, Dean, I know, I don't know if everybody knows that you're a semi pro race car driver and uh, also a student of the game of football. And, uh, you know, one of the fascinating things about my having known you for, I don't know how many years, I want to go there. Uh, was the fact that you have so many facets uh, to your personality uh, other than the art, which is your life. But I'd ever see, I, I was always wondering why I don't see your work uh, on, uh, you know, football or race cars or, and I know that you know a lot of the musical artists that uh, you listen to are personal friends of yours and uh, do you ever consider any of those subjects as a possibility for some, some artwork? Um, when I was starting out, I did a lot of paintings of race cars when I was a kid. And um, I did paintings of boxers, Muhammad Ali, because I was also a big boxing fan. Um, and I, yeah, I did, um, golly, I did, oh, 1977, I did a when we beat the Gators for the first time in 10 years, I did this poster that became famous of Roger Overby holding the football up with his Florida State jersey on and everything. And I made it into a poster and I sold 3,000 of them. 
but since then, no, uh, it's, I don't feel drawn to do that. You know, there's people who paint race cars so good. I would be in over my head and I just don't have that interest. And then, yeah, same with football. I, I'm not a sports artist. I'm a sports fan, but I only got so much juice, you know, and I got to moderate it, use it the right way. If that answers your question. Yes, thank you. All right, I think we had um, a question. Also, I'd like to say also, Richard is one of my biggest collectors in Tallahassee for which I'm eternally grateful. I think he must have 15 or 20 paintings. Thank you, Richard. Oh, that's great to have Our you pleasure. on here. Our pleasure. Um, we have a question um, from Betty Jane Grant. She said, my first experience with your work was huge. It was a wall-sized horror scene and I was entrenched, could hardly bear to leave it. Is there a particular thing that draws you to large outside paintings as opposed to the small indoor paintings or the smaller outdoor, like the abandoned gas station? Um, I, I think it's really just a matter of, you know, you de I develop themes and images on a smaller surface until I become comfortable with the idea that, hey, this really works. Because if you're gonna go big, that's a lot of time and a lot of energy. And you wanna go big with something that has a proven result. You know, you're gonna get something out of it. So, and then also it's like, it's, you want it to be an image that's sort of encompassing that you can sort of walk into if it's going to be really big i want it to have the feeling of you are there you're you're a part of that so only certain images lend themselves to those requirements i guess and um, I, I don't do a lot of big paintings anymore because they become harder and harder to sell and i really can't put my finger on it because they used to not be but even in galleries and stuff, it's like uh, those big paintings are just sitting around and they used to just jump. So I don't know, I, I can't explain it. I just do it. All right. Well, I think that was probably the last of our questions. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much to Dean for being here and, and um, joining us over uh, Zoom and everyone else at home and Grace, I don't know if you wanted to say um, uh, thank you to everybody and and yeah, I just um, wanted to share a couple comments that were in the Sorry, hold on. I accidentally, I think you got unmuted. Hold on. There you am. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted to share a couple comments that were in the chat just to make sure everybody has seen them. One from Rosalind that said, um, Dean, thank you for your openness and honesty. You are clearly inspired to paint as you do. And this one from Gary, and it was echoed by others. Dean, I've marveled at and admired your work for 40 years or so, but had never had the opportunity to hear you talk about your work. You're so humble in your description of what and how you do what you do, which is further evidence of how truly gifted you are. Thank you for sharing that gift with us through the years and today. And I Thank just like to follow that you. by um, thanking you, Dean, for exhibiting with Gadsden Arts. It's always our honor to share the work of artists from our region, especially our leading artists from the region. Um, we know that's a lot of commitment on your part. And, and thank you so much for being here to talk to everybody live today as well. It's been great fun. Um, as I said, I followed your career since I've been here and I learned a lot today. So thank you. Well, I, I really enjoyed doing it. And I appreciate the opportunity. So thanks. Thank you, Dean. Bye, Ruth. Bye. With that, thank you all. I hope you have a great Friday and a wonderful weekend. Everybody stay safe out there and we hope to see you at the museum. Bye. Bye.